Richard Kraft had an extramarital affair for over 20 years. He didn't want people to know that she had left him. They had no murder weapon. They had no witnesses. They didn't want to believe that she wasn't alive, but nonetheless, the disappearance was under very mysterious circumstances. Welcome to the Crime Stories Control Room. This is Murder Time. The story I'm pulling from the vault today is a bit of a heartbreaker. Some innocent kids lose their mother to a murderous father and then learn he mutilated her remains. Our story begins in Picture Postcard, Connecticut in the winter of 1986. Detective Michael DeJoseph of the Newtown Police Department has a problem. People keep telling him a local woman is missing, but her husband says she's not. He said that she went to Denmark because her mother was sick. She is Hella Crafts, a 39-year-old mother of three and a career airline attendant. Hella wants a divorce from her husband, airline pilot Richard. He's a man she deeply fears. She's so scared, she leaves her friends a message that sends chills. This is reporter Lisa Peterson. She thought Richard might be angry at her. And also, if uh, she should disappear or if anything should happen to her, not to assume it was an accident. It's an unusual message and an unusual missing persons case, especially in sleepy, affluent Connecticut. Newtown, Connecticut in the 1980s was a very quiet community, very rural. It's hilly, it's wooded, it has lakes and streams. It had wonderful schools, nice atmosphere, very safe place for you to raise your family. It's a great place to live. It's not a place known for major crime. And yet, Hella Crafts has vanished. Detective Michael DeJoseph is a seasoned investigator. He has a typical gumshoe look. Intelligent, tough, strong. And he authentically connects with his victims, including Hella. A lovely person, a mom, a caring mom, a working mom, who really doted on her children. Reporter Lisa Peterson's crime beat includes Newtown. Hella Crafts is a 39-year-old um, airline flight attendant. Uh, she worked for Pan American Airlines, married to a pilot, um, Richard Crafts. She was your typical working mother in the 1980s who wanted to have it all. The family, the career, the lovely house. And lovely it is, a rambling four-bedroom house on a big lot. With her high-flying job, Hella needs a live-in nanny. Her nanny's name is Dawn Marie Thomas. She was employed by Mrs. Crafts, um, principally because Hella was traveled a lot because of her job. On November 18, 1986, Hella flies in from Frankfurt, Germany to the Big Apple. She arrived at JFK Airport, and then her and another flight attendant drove back to Helly's house. The children were there, Richard was there. Hella and Richard have been together for 17 years and married for 11. On the outside, everything looks perfect. Helly and Richard had three children. They were here in Newtown schools. Occasionally their parents would come to school for career day and they would be the flight attendant and the pilot. And they're active in the community. In fact, Richard is a part-time cop. Michael DeJoseph explains. His job as an auxiliary policeman in Newtown would have been to check a vac vacant houses, people were on vacation, do non-traditional law enforcement work, direct traffic if needed, assist at motor vehicle accident scenes. But tonight, it's another tense evening in the Crafts house. Voices are raised, hurtful and angry words spoken. As a quiet counterpoint, snow softly falls and falls 
and falls. Uncharacteristic snowstorm for that time in November. Very wet snow, uh, power went out, widespread power outage in the Newtown area. The next morning, Richard wakes the kids, telling them they're going on a surprise visit to his sisters. And he says this about their mother. He said Helly Crafts had gotten out of bed, gotten dressed, taken her flight bags, and left the house without so much as a goodbye. Richard Crafts drives his family to Westport. By that evening, there's still no word from Hella. Reconstructing known facts is Newtown chief criminologist, Dr. Henry Lee. So we know Hella was alive when her colleague dropped her in front of the house. We know she disappeared when the nanny wake up. And that was the last time anyone had seen her. No trail just disappeared out of thin air. Two days crawl by. Hella's co-worker and friend, Trudy Horvath, calls Richard and asks after Hella. Richard tells Trudy Hella's tripping, gone to comfort her sick mother in Denmark. And that Hella was going to see her for a few days. He, this is what he told the live-in babysitter, Domery Thomas, and he also told the children. But that story doesn't sit right with Hella's friends. As he investigates, Michael DeJoseph keeps hearing the same thing. Hella's friends thought that she was a wonderful woman, obviously, a good mom, a hard worker, good wife. But the Crafts house is not a happy home. Lisa Peterson hears whispers of trouble in paradise. Richard Crafts had an extramarital affair for over 20 years with a particular flight attendant. So uh, it wasn't something that just showed up. It was sort of a, a part of who he was. He had always um, had other relationships with other women. Hella has hired help, divorce lawyer Diane Anderson. It was at the urging of Diane Anderson for Hella to hire a private investigator to help her document the fact that Richard was, in fact, having an affair. The private dick is Keith Mayo, and he gets the goods. Pictures of Richard and his mistress doing the deed. But Richard resists Hella's petition. But he did not allow uh, the sheriff to serve him with divorce papers. He kept making excuses, uh, made an appointment to be served the papers, and then didn't show up. You know, he wasn't making it really easy for her. So obviously there was, you know, some issue with not wanting to get divorced. So now, nearly a week later, no Hella. Her friends file a missing persons report with the Newtown Police Department, and they recall Hella's dire warning. She began to tell friends things like, um, you know, she thought Richard might be angry at her, and also that if uh, she should disappear, or if anything should happen to her, not to assume it was an accident. When she did disappear, uh, that phrase, if anything should happen to me, don't assume it's an accident, came back to haunt them. Hella's friend and fellow Scandinavian reaches out to Hella's mom. Lena Johansson called Denmark to talk to Mrs. Nielsen, who was Helly Kraft's mother. And what Lena had learned is that Mrs. Nielsen wasn't ill, and also that she hadn't spoken to Hella Crafts in several weeks. The news sets off a ripple of fear through Hella's friends. Detective DeJoseph. They were increasingly alarmed by her not responding to their calls and by her husband's making excuses about where she was. They didn't want to believe that she wasn't alive, but nonetheless, the disappearance was under very mysterious circumstances. Helicraft's friends uh, didn't really like Richard, especially after Helicraft's disappeared. In light of the disturbing intel, detectives buttonhole Crafts. Richard Crafts was approached by one of my colleagues in the early part of December and asked, where's your wife? There are a lot of people who are suggesting that something could have happened to her, that she's missing. Is she missing? 
he just maintained the same story that he had told other investigators that his wife just simply got up and left the house on November 19th. Kraft's a cool customer. He even agrees to take a lie detector test. It was an extensive examination administered by the Connecticut State Police, two polygraph examiners. It probably took between two to three hours. And they asked him questions relative to the disappearance of his wife. According to the polygraph examiners, he passed the polygraph test with no deception. The examiner's opinion, Crafts does not know where Hella is. People were wondering how could such a lovely woman with children just disappear without contacting anyone? Why would a mother get up and just leave without saying goodbye to her children? Although he allegedly passed the polygraph examination, there were still questions that were no answers for. But the polygraph reveals Krafts was lying about Hella heading to Denmark. He admits he lied, and why. And his response was, well, I didn't want to air my dirty laundry about my marriage because it's really no one's business. He didn't want people to know that she had left him. Desperate for new leads, Newtown police ask for help from the Connecticut State Police. Chief criminologist Henry Lee reviews evidence, then puts together a task force. I was contacted at a forensic laboratory, got involved in assisting investigation. We decide to put the case together. Meantime, Mike DeJoseph keeps his missing persons inquiry marching on. You uh, gather all the information you can about the person who's missing. You gather financial data, credit card data, places where the person might go, friends, associates, and you go from there. And did Joseph keeps other lines of inquiry open? There was a lot of information coming into police headquarters relative to um, the disappearance of Hella Krabs. There were extensive interviews done with Hella's fr friends and family, either by myself or the other investigators who were working the case. And they also interviewed, started interviewing neighbors, uh, looking into financial records to see if Helly's credit card had been used anywhere. And there was no activity for Helly Crafts. She had been missing since November 19th. She had missed the Thanksgiving dinner with the family. And then Nanny Dawn Thomas recalls something unusual. Ms. Thomas told investigators that she had seen some stains on a carpet. And when she asked Richard Crafts what that stain was, he said it was from the kerosene heater. During Storm Carl, the electricity went out. He had taken two kerosene heaters out of the garage and brought them into the house, one in the master bedroom. He said the heater had spilled the kerosene. And the nanny adds. In that Mr. Crafts had subsequently removed the, a carpet from uh, the Crafts bedroom. He told investigators that he had taken the carpet out of his home, but had put it in a landfill in, in Newtown. Keith Mayo, Hella's private eye, takes a trip to the dump. And found a carpet in the landfill. The carpet was turned over to the investigative team who um, took the carpet to the lab, the forensic science laboratory, submitted for analysis. It was nothing on the carpet to suggest that there was any um, trace evidence, blood, or any other substance that could link the carpet to Mrs. Crafts or to Mr. Crafts. A lot of effort to hit a dead end. Cops turned to Kraft's financial activity. We were working with credit card companies, trying to determine if he had made any purchases, odd purchases, in the weeks following his wife's uh, disappearance. The first thing that Newtown police found was that he had charged uh, some bedding. He had bought some pillows and a new comforter. Um, which was kind of unusual. He did it the day after the storm, so that was kind of odd. But there's something else on the credit card statement that catches Michael DeJoseph's eye. Mr. Crafts had rented a wood chip during the storm, the November 18, 1920 storm. What's a wood chipper? Well, it's a machine that grinds huge, hard tree branches into itsy bitsy pieces. 
and that immediately um, raised our suspicions even more that something terrible had happened. So the Newtown Police Department was really setting the groundwork for uh, an investigation into a homicide. As the bedding factored in, as the wood chipper factored in, building the probable cause for the search warrant was, was moving ahead. So a picture of deadly malfeasance emerges, and a judge signs a search warrant to dive deep into the Kraft's home. On Christmas Day, they pull the trigger. Lisa Peterson describes the scene. Carpets had been torn up. Furniture was all askew in different bedrooms. They found some things that had been burned in the fireplace. It wasn't what you'd expect to find in a family home. The heavy hitters, a forensics team led by Dr. Henry Lee, combed the scene. And we found the king size matches was put on the side. We found some blood spatter on the matches. The types of forensic tests that Dr. Lee and his team would have done in the house might have included a presumptive test for blood, especially the blood splattering that they found on the mattress. They would also look for blood in places like down the drains in a tub or a sink. They would use luminol on the walls to see if there was blood splatter there as well. Blood spatter. Experts analyze the volume and position of blood droplets to determine movements used to create patterns. In the bedroom, the matches alone give us a clue something have to have a medium force, impact force, to get those spatter, to produce those spatter. Testing reveals the blood is that of a female, and the blood type matches Hella. But that's not enough hard evidence to call her crafts. Lisa Peterson. The police didn't have a lot to go on. They had no murder weapon. They had no crime scene. They had no witnesses. Criminologist Henry Lee. When Halicraft first disappeared, we think of all four possibilities. First, run away. Second, kidnapped. Third, some accident happened. Fourth, she be murdered. If she was murdered, where's the body? When we search their house, we look at the refrigerator, we even looked at a septic tank, every place. We did not find her body. So now the investigation stalls. Then, more than a month after Hella's disappearance, a snowplow driver named Joseph Hine comes forward with a case-breaking story about something he saw the night of the big storm. It was either very late at night or early in the morning. Just no one was out. Mr. Hines saw a man in the middle of a storm. It was very strange. The man Hines sees is Richard Crafts. The snowplow operator tells police he passed by once and then back again several hours later. Hines even said Mr. Crafts, as Mr. Hines' plow approached, Mr. Crafts just motioned for Mr. Hines to go around him. Mr. Hines' story was very important because it put Mr. Crafts on the steel bridge. The steel bridge crosses the Housatonic River. Hines' statement rings a bell for Dr. Henry Lee, that forensic specialist with the state police. We want to know where's the body. Through the witness statement, we think the most likely place is the Lake Zor. Lake Zor exists as part of the Housatonic, a short drive from the Kraft's home. Forensic specialists set up shop beneath that steel bridge where snowplow operator Joe Hines saw Kraft's and his wood chipper. Lisa Peterson and the press tailed a major crime squad. Uh, I had gone down to Lake Zor early on in the investigation. It was interesting to watch because they were working furiously. They had erected a tent village where uh, people from the major crime squad were working, and so they brought in the major crime squad van, and they started to sift through all these piles of wood chips that they had found along the edge of uh, Lake Zor. Took us days and days, and uh, in this cold weather, we found 56 little bone chips, 2,660 hairs. We found the twos. 
What Henry Lee's team finds is a soggy pile of small and shredded bits of a human being. But the name of the game is linkage, creating that vital chain of evidence. We found a dental crumb. We found a half of the toenail and part of the finger. We was able to link the hair together. We linked the tooth together. We linked the bone together. Now we can positively say Alacross was murdered. There's less than three ounces of Hella left, and the cold, careful work on the Lake Zor shore yields another critical piece of linkage for De Joseph. There was shredded mail found in the vicinity where Mr. Hine had seen Mr. Krabs, and the mail happened to be um, a correspondence from Mrs. Krabs' mother. Then, police divers working the current below the bridge hit the jackpot. They find a chainsaw. When the divers brought the saw to the surface, it was later examined by um, forensic people. I think there was human tissue on the chainsaw. The chainsaw belongs to Crafts. He bought it at a local hardware store. Henry Lee follows up. We talked to the owner. He said, well, I have a receipt in the shoebox. Visa, $499 for that chainsaw. Richard Crafts on it. The serial number, E5921616. Always remember. That clue link this chainsaw to Richard Kraft. It's a major breakthrough. The gathering of forensic evidence in the Helicraft murder is precedent setting. It's clear Krafts has chopped up and shredded his special someone. You have to remember that there had never been an arrest, let alone a conviction, in the state of Connecticut or even in the United States without a body. Newtown detective Michael DeJoseph prepares to collar Krafts, and though he stages a standoff for a few hours, Krafts soon surrenders. It's a sensational story that Lisa Peterson is following. Back in the 1980s, it wasn't the 24-7 news machine that we have today. There was no Fox News Channel or CNN. And this case really sparked that kind of coverage here in Connecticut. So when it finally broke and Richard was arrested, the media descended on Newtown, Connecticut from all over the world, from Denmark, from New York City, um, from all over, all over Connecticut. And it was just this huge media circus. Detective Michael DeJoseph and criminologist Henry Lee have put together a very complex case. The first trial took four and a half months. There were hundreds of witnesses, thousands of pieces of evidence and documents that were put into evidence. Uh, and it was very painstakingly presented. This is the most lengthy investigation we ever conducted at that time. A lot of physical evidence, DNA typing, Blood grouping, hair comparison, tool mark comparison, fabric comparison, handwriting analysis. And after four and a half months, a hung jury. It went into 17 days of deliberations, which was also the longest in state history. One juror um, refused to deliberate anymore because uh, he was voting for an acquittal. And as far as he was concerned, um, no nothing was going to change his mind. A second trial is ordered and moved to Norwalk, Connecticut. It's now 1989, and state prosecutor Walter Flanagan tries his case again. Michael DeJoseph and Henry Lee recall the prosecution's crime timeline. Helen returned from her trip. Either that night or early the next morning, Helen and Richard argued. Richard assaulted her in the house, probably killed her in the house. Helen was hit with something, a blunt object. Richard is pretty strong. Killed her in the house with a blunt object. Crafts then carries Helen to the backyard and drops her in his freezer. The corpse chills because a fresh body, when you cut, pretty difficult with a chisel. Once it froze, you can cut in sections. But then that massive snowstorm knocks out the power. Kratz improvises. 
He hauls his kids to his sister's, saying he'll be back at two. Uh, he did not pick them up until that night. He rents a truck and a wood chipper. Detective DeJoseph conjectures. In his mind, he thought that there's no oddity in me having a wood chipper because I've had it before, I've rented it before, there's a paper trail. People know that I do lot clearing, so it would not be uncommon for me to have a wood chipper. Crafts drives his rented truck onto a bridge across the Housatonic, starts up his chainsaw, starts up his wood chipper. Then he chops his wife's body into chunks and drops them to the chipper. A cascade of blood and bone and tissue falling onto the shoreline below. And the snowstorm of the century soon conceals his deed. If Joe Hine hadn't spotted crafts on that bridge, his plan may have worked. As the details play out in court, Richard sits stone-faced. Richard's demeanor in court, I would characterize as being uh, the same as it always been, very low-key, very um, nonchalant. This time, it takes the jury just three days to return their verdict. Crafts is guilty of first-degree murder. Crafts was sentenced to 50 years in prison. And at the time, in the state of Connecticut, uh, there was no allowance for paroles. It's taken three long years to bring the vicious killer to justice. It's the best outcome for Detective Michael DeJoseph. Although it took two trials to convict him, I think justice was still served. Kraus today lives in the state of Connecticut. He's up at the Summers Correctional Institute. How did the Crafts murder case affect young reporter Lisa Peterson? The Richard Crafts murder trial was a case of a lifetime for a journalist. It was high profile, it was groundbreaking, it was historic. And as a young journalist for me, it was um, a wonderful opportunity to really um, you know, do some great work, journalistically speaking. I tried really hard to be very objective and to present both sides, um, which you know, is difficult in an, in an intricate case like this. And how does Detective Michael DeJoseph remember the most sensational crime of his career? I think I remember what everyone else remembers, is that how could anybody murder your wife and put her through a wood chip? It's just unbelievable. And what always pops into my mind about this case is a snowstorm in a beautiful, small New England community and all spoiled by a murder. Thanks for listening. See you next time for more Murder Time. Simon Decker wrote and produced The Chainsaw Killer, working with files from the television series Crime Stories, Blood Lies and Alibis, and Catching Killers. Our executive producer is Ron Getz. Our supervising producer is Robert Laughlin, and our technical producer is Joe Watts. Murder Time is a production of Partners in Motion.